And I'll tell you what, Chase, looking at these deer today, they are so tough to pick up in the shadows. Really? They're so tough to pick up in Because they're dark. The shadows. They're like the same color as the vegetation. We left fish to find fish, but we're comfortable oh. in the tent now. It's windy as hell, but we found this little cut. To tell you the truth, that means that you executed a good trigger pull. Yeah, I, I pulled slowly. You and me would disagree on this. You know, I, I am a capitalist, but I, I do recognize that wildlife is managed as a collective good in the United States yeah. um, and is utilized as such. And I think that that's a very good thing for wildlife. They're not big enough to hop on and they're not small enough to step on. They're like the worst size rock. The devil made that rock pile. It was evil terrain. And yet we saw the most deer sign in that terrain. I mean, we are the apex predator. Maybe if there's other planets, there's a better apex predator that's existed, but <laughs> not, not here on planet Earth. Like we'll go fly fish if we don't there's see no any. animals. No, there's animals. 10 deer and 40 bear ships. Yeah. It's delicious meat. It's organic. It's sustainably harvested. Imagine just waking up in the morning, you just get out of your tent, and you just see a cloud of fish flying from the sky. It's like, you think it's the apocalypse or something. <laughs> on this side of that ridge is like this larger drainage and on that side of the ridge is like the clear creek drainage. Mm -hmm. I would rather have one good argument. <laughs> <laughs> if I pull a bear tag, maybe I'll come up with the one good argument in the forest, like while we're walking around, which is say that I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Like when it's in your scope. So what's up? Um, nothing, man. Busy as hell. <laughs> the way Busy your palm well. is on your forehead right now, your fingers. <laughs> what am I looking stressed out right it's now? Little, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I'm, I'm chill. This is like, like, this is the fun stuff. This is the time to relax. So let's talk about the show a little bit. Yep. I feel like it, the genesis of it came in Kennebunkport this last summer. Yep. When yep. we got into this like pretty detailed heated discussion about apex predators and wolves. Yep, I in remember that. Idaho, in Idaho, et cetera. Yeah. And the whole family was kind of sitting around listening and uh, kind of chiming in. But I think with us, it's kind of hard to get a word in edgewise, especially when we're going at it. And then afterwards, like Jonathan came up to me and was just like, you know, like no one has the tolerance to talk to Stephen for as long as you just did about hunting. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, the what? patience that you just demonstrated. <laughs> he was just totally shocked. He yeah. was like, wow, you really went toe to toe. You, you really like asked him the right questions. And also you just like, you know, the Taurus <laughs> energy that you that bring. pissed off at you. Exactly. <laughs> of course. Yeah. exactly. And so I was like, oh, wow. If that was, I mean, and also I had the best time because we've been talking, we've been debating things for 20 years now since we were what nine years old yeah eight and so it just and, and then on top of that you were always trying to get me to go hunting with you and i even tried to come in november and we had that yeah that misstep where you got the elk on like the first day and i was going to come late and whatnot and yeah. so i just started thinking like wow i do really want to learn more about this thing that you're so passionate about and i want to also go hunting with you so why not make uh, a recording experience out of it. Um, yeah. And I also yeah. just found that I was learning so much from talking about you. Like you have a really incredible capacity to like obsessively study something and like relay all of this rich detail and knowledge. And it's, it's just, it was amazing. I became hooked on it, honestly, just from listening to you talk about all the various facets of it. Yeah. And then on top of that, I'm also like studying ecology and wildlife management and getting kind of more into what it might mean to think of the ecology as something that people are much more engaged in than they are now. And hunting seemed to be like this very like sort of contemporary culture that was foreign to me in a An lot of ways. Culture. Ancient, of course, <laughs> of course, ancient, but simultaneously like very influenced by policy and very like in a moment right now where I feel like if it's not in crisis, it's having a growth moment and it's sort of having to change. And like, I don't want to say rebrand itself, but kind of figure itself out. Right. It's like, totally. there, it's a very lively debate. And totally. I think it's very also politically polarizing 
in a way mm-hmm. that like a lot of people on either side of the debate don't really speak to each other in a way that I appreciate. And I think yeah. that's something that we've always been able to do. Yeah. So many points I'd like to pick up on there. I mean, so one of the things that made me interested in doing a podcast with you is like you said, you know, I've become really interested in hunting. Um, and there's so many things that, that you need to learn in order to become a hunter. Like the, like the, the first thing is just like, what weapon system are you going to use? You know, like when I went down to Texas, I had never seen a gun before. It was like yeah. such a foreign idea that like, wait, you just have guns and they just like die laughing at me in Texas, you know? And I like told them that like I had never shot a gun and like thought they were kind of scary and like, we're going to fix that right quick, you know? And, and brought me out to the ranch and, and, um, I mean, so th- I had to learn about that first. Then you need to learn about, okay, um, how do you shoot a deer? Where do you shoot on it? Um, what are good places to look for deer? How do you hunt deer? Uh, how do you, what's different about a whitetail versus an elk versus a mule deer versus an antelope? Um, how do you get permits to hunt these things, right? These Mm -hmm. are all each of them really deep rabbit holes that I had to dive down and, and, and figure out and learn about, um, butchering deer, cooking deer, all of that. And, and sort of as I matured in this, Uh, I'm starting to get to higher and higher levels. And what you realize is that a lot of it comes down to ecology. If you want to really be a good hunter, you need to understand ecology. You need to understand how landscapes function and Mm -hmm. where your prey fit in um, on that landscape in different times of the year, under different circumstances, under different conditions. Um, and and, And I thought it would be really interesting to talk to someone like you who has you know, is, is getting a PhD. I mean, it's like as sophisticated as it gets along those lines and, and someone who's coming at these issues of ecology, of wildlife biology, of wildlife conservation, but from a completely different perspective of a Mm -hmm. hunter. Mm -hmm. So we're both, we're both kind of narrowing in on a a similar field of study, but Mm -hmm. coming at it from such different angles. And I'd be so like, I just thought that there would be some good interplay there. Um, yeah, I wonder what we would call like the confluence if it's not necessarily hunting. It's to me some kind of style or sensibility of like orienting yourself in the world, like within an ecology of other creatures. Yeah, right. Totally. And and I feel like we both have very different approaches and reasons for doing it, but in some sense, the sensibilities that you develop and refine are like kind of similar. Like I also think it's, it's almost the same like fundamental draw. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like to understand the natural world around us and to, and to participate in it, you mm-hmm. know, and there's just different ways of understanding and different ways of participating. But, but the base motivation is the same in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the main difference is, and this isn't even such a difference when you really get into it, but like you're doing it in order to harvest game meat and I'm doing it to either sort of capture images or understanding or to cultivate new relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and even that though, that leads us down similar paths. Like I think that the way you go about it is so, is so similar except for this, this, this fact of killing, you know? Yep. Um, and I don't think that in my perspective, in my practice of, feeling connected to nature that I'm exist outside of the killing by any means, right? Like just living is in a some sense, taking the lives of other things around you. Good point. Uh, That's what I was going to go there. But there is a big gray area, right? And, and a question of ethics and politics and how you do it and what it means to you and who you do it with and for what purpose that I think is something that I would really love to explore more in which we already have done a lot, I think in the last year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was something that was so like being a hunter, like caused you to like question so many things, so many like things that you thought that you understood about the world previously. I mean, like what I realized Mm. once I started eating my own meat is like, I was always killing these animals. I was just doing with my credit card instead of a gun. Um, totally. (laughs) And I mean, so many people have been like, you wouldn't shoot a deer, would you? And I'm like, we're literally eating steak right now or <laughs> yeah like, and even if you're a vegetarian right like drive through kansas nebraska iowa anywhere in the country really central valley in california um 
how many pesticides are they putting on those on those fields? How many mice are they churning up when they plow every single year? Um, think of all of the wildlife that had to be killed or dislocated in order to plant those fields in the first place. Yeah. And then not only the loss of those animals' lives, but the loss of all of the lives of the deer that would have occupied those habitats in perpetuity had you not put that field there. So, I, I mean, like yeah. these are things that like, I don't know. One of the reasons I appreciate hunting so so much is because it's sort of caused me to think more critically about all these all these types of things. And I and I, like I, talking to you, I feel like I've come to some understandings about these things. But like in no way do I feel like I've got it all figured out. And I feel like you're such a good thinker and such a good communicator that I knew that kind of talking to you about this stuff would I don't know I would grow through it. Um, totally, but. It's really crazy to think about the fact that, like, dude, how are we still friends? <laughs> like, why are we still friends? I mean, it, the the origin story is is wild because w- even just the fact that we are friends to begin with is kind of random. Like, you were in my third and fourth grade class for like two years. Two I guess years. you were in fifth grade too. Fifth grade too. But you had already moved. No, no, no. Anyways, but for two years and third, then fourth and fifth. Okay, three. And then we just kind of became not even friends right away. I remember in third grade, we weren't that friends. You were hanging out with Paul Michael and like, we're kind of like more into like sports and wrestling. And shit. No, we were, like, no, honestly, where we, where we were friends at first was because we were both good at soccer. True. Yeah, I remember you we wore like a green soccer. jersey with a number three, like a t-shirt. Do you remember that yeah. shirt? <laughs> no, I don't. That's an amazing memory though. It was like green and yellow with a number three. Yeah. But yeah, we played soccer and then we were on the same traveling team. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. But in Red any case, you're, when you moved back to Boston, and even before you were already spending your summers there and your mom invited me to come stay with y'all for a few weeks. Well, it's funny. It almost comes full circle because one thing you're leaving out here that I think that's really important to the conversation is, you know, we became friends because we were both on, you know, played soccer together, but I think what really drew us together is we were the only kids who were like so weird and loved to go catch lizards and snakes. So again, going out into natural spaces and trying to collect things from those natural spaces and like we would just be obsessed with lizards and snakes. And we would I'd go over to your house and we'd spend all day trying to run those things down, catching blue bellies and alligator lizards and you know a a skink if we got lucky and running into (laughs) gopher snakes and rattlesnakes and all that stuff. Yeah. So the natural world was, I feel like the inception of a lot of it. No, of course. And, and fishing too. You remember when we went to Triumpho Creek and I showed up with a spin rod and you showed up with like a Royal coachman and your fly fishing (laughs) tank. We were like fishing (laughs) in this like mud hole basically. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, what the hell is fly fishing? I'd never heard of it or whatnot. And I was just getting into fishing then too, because of my uncle. And then you picked up the fly fishing really quickly. Yeah. I mean, like by the time I left California, you were like, as good as me. Like you were fly fishing all the time. I felt like you'd go up to Mammoth. We went up to Mammoth, right? But that was after I feel like I was already introduced to it more by your dad on like the Wild River too. Yeah. Like that first year in fourth grade when we came back when we like still weren't even able to tie our own knots. Your dad was like tying surgery <laughs> knots and stuff for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But then, yeah, we had this kind of like bi-coastal friendship for like 10, 10 years after that, even where I would visit you in the summers in Concord and we would like go to Estabrook Woods and tra- traipse around there catching water snakes and bullfrogs and then go up into the White Mountains and you would come out and see yep. some of the old LA friends and we'd go up to Mammoth and go fly fishing and doing all sorts of things. So like we yep. had this weird, like almost like a personal summer <laughs> camp or something yeah. where we would just like hang out in the summers, but like half on each side of the coast. Yeah. I think it's so weird. And like, like I'm kind of proud of it because, you know, I, I, I still have, you know, a lot of great friends from the kids I went to school with, but I do feel like in general, I could be better about keeping in touch with people. It's not like my greatest skill ability, yeah. you know, it's like, Hey, I should check in with such and such, you know, it's just like not something that I really do, but I almost feel like that connection to the natural world, like always, was like a unique kind of connection that we had, like a more durable connection in some way. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're so fucking different. Could you imagine us like being friends without it? Kind of like, it's pretty amazing. No, you would totally write me off and I'd do the same, you know? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> just that today in your fucking orange tiger pants. <laughs> what the fuck is this guy? <laughs> yeah. I wonder what would have happened. I also think that there's something about fishing or catching things generally or like being in nature with a plan that like really creates yeah. this like mind meld that is different. It's like a different kind of relationship. Like in Kenny Bencourt this summer going out with your brother and your dad on the boat and like seeing this like whole kind of like symphony of like driving the boat and casting this side, casting the right side and like all the theorizing that's happening. Like you're about, on the like, left side. I'm on the right side. I'll fish low in the water column. You fish high in the water column. Like, exactly. Just like, yeah. and being like, then constantly like troubleshooting the situation too. And being like, why aren't we catching anything here? Should we move here? Is it like the weather? Like maybe yeah. we should switch up the rigs. It's like a constant like sharing of like a mind and like becoming this like family unit in order to like kind of like forage or catch things or just like understand the natural world. And I feel like there was something so intoxicating to me about like being a part of a group like that. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, it's primal. Like I, I would take it a step further to say that like, I, I, I feel like I've heard a lot of theories about like the development of human intelligence itself. And I, from what I understand, a lot of it had to do with like us starting to eat meat, which was much more nutritionally dense and allowed um, sort of that, energetic surplus to go towards our brains that was Whoa. then used to coordinate uh hunting activities right like uh, mm. you know we're not, no human is strong enough to take down a gazelle in africa right but if we work together and, and we strategize and you get that mind meld going that you're talking about um you can be successful and i think that like you know there's a lot of theories that and I, I don't know, I believe him that that's what led to the development of human intelligence. And, and in order to do that, you also have to trust your, your hunting partners, right? Like there has yeah. to be like that development of trust and, and that building of com camaraderie and social relationships in order to effectively coordinate a group hunt like that. And yeah, so totally. like, not only that, but that, that like, you know, the strongest guy isn't just going to beat up all the weaker guys once they actually finally get the gazelle on the ground. Like everyone's going to get some of the meat, regardless of, you know, who might be the strongest. And so I think that like that connection is a uniquely uh, durable connection. And it, it's, it, I don't know, it, sample size of one here, but to me, it, it, it checks out. I believe that certain intelligence were developed that way. And like, it totally makes sense that like, a little bit of meat caused our brains to grow, which allowed us to get more meat. But I also feel like it is a particular type of intelligence that's developed this way. One that's kind of like more linear and like future oriented and like about planning and about like literally like throwing a spear or like moving quickly from A to B in a very linear fashion. And I feel like that affects a lot of like the kind of thought that's generated in those spaces. But like you could also imagine and this like the sci-fi writer who I really love, like Ursula Gwynn has this like really cool theory called the carrier bag theory of fiction, where she says like most of our stories are based on like the hero's journey and this like linear myth of like progress and like developing in like an A to B time of fashion, because like the stories that like became popular oftentimes were like written about hunts and about like the heroes that came back from the hunt. Mm, right. But mm. what she says in this theory of carry bag theory of fiction is like, there were also a bunch of women and other people like picking berries and like collecting things in baskets and bags. And like, while they're doing that, they're like telling stories to each other too. And like, mm. that's a different kind of kind of uh, intelligence. That's much more like less linear, like more about like your, not more or less about your relationships, just like different. Right. And she kind of is trying, was trying to move storytelling more towards like a gathering rather than a hunting, which kind of changes the structure of the story. Mm. Yeah. I, I, a couple comments there. First of all, I will acknowledge that I kind of named one set of theories that I've heard with respect to the development of human intelligence. I'm very well aware of all the theories that just uh, our intelligence developed in response to having to navigate ever larger social networks, right? Totally. Like that's yeah. enormously <laughs> complex. Um, undertaking right to like be successful re to be reproductively successful in a large social um in a large social group um but and and but i mean the story thing uh, maybe i can get along with that a little bit i think <laughs> picking a bunch of berries uh makes for a significantly less awesome of a story than like <laughs> dude imagine how fucking stoked you would be if you were literally on the edge of survival you're starving to death 
And then the guys come back with a fucking <laughs> antelope on their back. You would be like, yes, like, this is amazing. <laughs> we need to write a story about this shit. This is incredible. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I see it. And I felt that way too when we were hunting, right? Like I was like, what are we going to tell people? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I, I feel like our first, I think something we should mention that's important context and all this is I feel like our first adult, I don't know. I feel like our childhood, our, our, our friendship was like, I don't want to say childish, but we're, we're kids, right? I feel like our first trip as adults and one of the most memorable, memorable trips I've ever had in my entire life was driving around the state of California for two weeks after our oh, freshman year in college. Yeah. Totally. I mean, that was incredible. I remember, you know, and, and, and we had maybe fallen out of, out of touch a little bit. And, and I, it was probably you who called me and said, Hey, I want to do this, this trip where we drive around the state of California, try and catch every native trout to the state of California. And then I'm going to write a fly fishing article and try and sell it to magazines about <laughs> our experience. Like, I don't want to get a job, typical chase, right? I don't want to get a job. I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather do this instead. And I was like, dude, count me in. And, and we, I, I don't know, that was incredible. We were just total trout bums and lived out of the car the whole time. And I don't think um, I've ever fished so many days in a row in my life. We fished it was so many hours. Like the top of my hand was just like completely tan <laughs> from yeah. holding my reel out. Yeah. We were sleeping in the car a lot. Also just like camping on the side of rivers in like unmarked campsites. It's also it's funny because like we didn't even know, like I'm sure like we just like pulled up on somebody's like like pasture and just pitched a tent a couple of times, you know? Like we didn't, I didn't know what was public land. I didn't even have like the conception of like public land. I was like, it's the river. I fish it. You know, remember when we got pulled over by the DEA up kind of near where we were. There's so many stories about that. Yeah. (laughs) So many stories from that trip, but that was one of the more memorable ones. (laughs) Totally. And then I remember like, then we had a pause and we didn't see each other for a long time. And then I was going on a driving a U-Haul from LA to Austin, Texas this was like six years later. I think this was the largest span of time where we hadn't really been in touch. You were living in Texas at this point and I yeah. swung through San Angelo yeah. and visited you there. And that was wild because all of a sudden you had a job and you were living in a house and you were even just getting into hunting and living in a completely different context in Texas. I was like, what the hell? Yeah, and then yeah. remember we went to the rattlesnake roundup, rattlesnake which roundup. was such a trip. I just remember driving there and seeing all of these like oil derricks and then solar wind far- or wind farms on like the Texas yeah. plain and then pulling into Sweetwater, Texas, which was like really kind of dilapidated town and seeing this kid like banging his football, like state championship ring on the counter of the gas station while he's like yeah. waiting for his receipt. And then the, 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 festival it was like a was Mecca. So dude. People came yeah, from all over, for all that thing. over. It was amazing. It was like a, it was like a Ren fair or something. There were like so many trucks and tents. And then the, the snake charmer in the basement of the rodeo arena with like all not the, basement on the floor in there with them. Yeah. yeah. And he's just like whispering over like the, the loudspeaker and like putting the whole arena into a trance as he's like, basically like sh- telling you about how the rattlesnake like can't see movement. It can only see, or it can only see movement. And so if you stop moving, then it can't see you. And then he just like paused and the rattlesnake's <laughs> head just like, coiled back down onto the table. Ooh. Yeah. But that was, that I feel was like an, another moment where we, we reconnected in a way that was sort of surprising. Yeah. And hadn't had, we hadn't seen each other in a minute, but was also a completely different sort of adventurous experience. Yeah. Ooh, there's been a minute, but yeah, the podcast has been cool. I feel like the hunting has kind of opened up a, a, a different dimension, but very much in line kind of yeah. with, We've always been very, you know what it is too? We've always been very goal oriented. Like we have not like had a friendship where it's like, Hey, like, do you want to come over and chill? Like (laughs) those words have never been said in our friendship before ever. Like we're always like, we are going to go catch a 28 inch striper (laughs) or like we are going to go catch a rattlesnake or like we're going to go get a deer or we're going to go get a steelhead or we're going to go to the rattlesnake roundup or, you know. You know what's also super different about this is it doesn't feel competitive. Except when we're steelhead fishing, I feel pretty competitive then. When we're steelhead fishing, yes, because we're like more on the same plane there. (laughs) But like with this, it has felt super different too in a way because I feel like you're, you're introducing me to like so many skills that I don't have just yet. 
and also hunting is different. I guess it does Hunting's feel definitely different. different. Like I would be more excited if you got a um, deer on our next trip. Like I yeah. don't care. I, I mean, I'd love to get a deer, but if you got one, I would be like over the moon. Yeah. Now with steelhead, if you got a steelhead before me, I would be pissed. I would not be the <laughs> least bit happy for you. <laughs> zero happiness for you i would be like like chase just take the goddamn pictures what do you have on (laughs) you know like what's your what's your indicator depth like i don't i'm done you know oh there's a mouse on my counter get the fuck out of here oh fuck a little mouse the light is on there was also a brass band playing earlier it's just comes with the territory (laughs) dude you Um, need to get out of there man that's like not safe I know. We, I've, I rarely see him. That's the first time I've seen him in months. You know what you need to do is, dude, you need to get a cat. You know what? Someone was maybe going to in with a cat. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I don't you know don't if Miss any... Boo Boo hunts mice, though. It's a cat and it hunts mice. Named Miss Boo Boo. <laughs> it's a cat. It and it's a male. He likes mice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm into just boondoggle, but it's also nice to have. Yeah, it's not your boondoggle or the boondoggle. Definitely not the boondoggle. I don't like not your boondoggle. You don't, don't like it. Like new words. Too many words. Fewer words. But maybe it would just like the full name would be not your boondoggle and then people would just call it boondoggle. <laughs> I just think that's too many words. You don't need that many words. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's just go with boondoggle. I absolutely love the definition of that word. It is the best word ever. Work <laughs> or activity that is wasteful or pointless, but gives the appearance of having value. <laughs> Such a good word. Such an outstanding <laughs> word. <laughs> but I'm sort of pro boondoggle. Depending. <laughs> of course you are. You're a gover- You're a government guy. Of course you think that's a good thing. <laughs> I'm just trying, I'm all about like reframing the purpose. You know, the same activity, it's just a different pursuit. All right, so should we do it like, I'm like, this is Stephen Winslow. And you're like, this is Chase Niesner. And this is Boondoggle. <laughs>